Hey everyone, welcome back. In this video, we're going to be doing an introduction to Support Vector Machines, a machine learning algorithm that has maybe the scariest name, but once we start looking at it, it actually is very, very intuitive. So I've decided to split this up into two videos. This first one will be just going over the intuition. There's not going to be any math on this board at all, if you've noticed. And in the other video, we'll be going through the math of SVM. I think that everything in one video could have just been a lot. So let's go through the intuition here. As always, we're going to have a context. So let's say that you are trying to predict if someone will or will not get into their top choice medical school. So we have these green triangles who are students who do get into their top choice medical school. So we're going to label them as plus one. And let's say we have these red X's, which are students who do not get into their top choice medical school. And we're going to label them as a negative one. Okay. And the two predictors we'll be using just so we can plot things in two dimensions are their GPA and their MCAT score. And as you probably would have expected, people who are getting better GPAs and scores are generally getting into their top choice school and people who are getting lower on those two metrics are not. So this kind of adds up. But now the question for you is, let's say we want to draw a line. So since we're just working in two dimensions, we're going to draw a line. But in higher dimensions, this becomes a plane and a hyperplane and so on. But just to keep things simple, let's say I ask you to draw a line between these two classes. So consider this your training data. Which line would you draw? So I've drawn a couple of candidates here. Would you draw a line L1? L2 or L3. Now I think that most people who even don't know about statistics or anything at all would probably choose L2 and here's the reason kind of outlined below. L1 doesn't seem great because although it does separate the two classes it is dangerously close to this class of negative one which means that if I introduce more observations of class negative one there is a good chance some of them might be on the wrong side of the line so L1 doesn't seem like a safe bet. What about L3? Well, L3 is also bad for the same reason. Yes, it separates the current data we have, but since it's dangerously close to these green triangles, you can imagine a new green triangle would come in and it would be on the wrong side. So L2 seems like the best fit. It's kind of this Goldilocks situation where it's just right. It's just in the middle of these two classes. It gives us some breathing room so that if new observations come in, they can still be on the correct side of the line and we feel more comfortable about that. Believe it or not, that's the end of SVM. That's how SVM works, just graphically. It chooses the best line or best plane or best hyperplane, who gives the most distance, or in official terms, as we'll see, gives the biggest margin between the two classes that we're trying to classify. Okay, so let's look at a little bit more SVM terminology, just so that when you go forward, you'll know what people are talking about. So here's the data again. Now this middle line here we've drawn is called the decision boundary so that everything on one side gets classified as a one and everything on the other side gets classified as a negative one. So this dashed line is the decision boundary. Now as we just stated we want the decision boundary to be kind of as far away from both classes as possible so that we maximize something called the margin. So this space right here is called the margin and the margin basically is such that the dashed line to the first class is the same distance as the dashed line to the other class. So this is called the margin. And the last part of the story and where this name support vector comes from are that some of the observations in our training data get the special name of support vector. And I've labeled them here. This green triangle is a support vector and these two red X's are support vectors. What makes them so special? They are the ones who are fully defining this margin. So notice that this margin is kind of leaning or being supported by this green triangle and by these two red X's. All the other data points that we're looking at are not directly contributing to where the margin is. Now another thing to note is that that means that every other data point in our data set is irrelevant in the sense that if we were to move these around, they don't change where the decision boundary is going to be and they don't change how big the margin is going to be. That is only dependent on the support vectors and that's why this is called a support vector machine. Now that seems like all the good advantages of SVMs, which is that they maximize this margin so that we have breathing room between the two classes, but that comes with a few disadvantages as well. Let me just spell one out in this video. So when we have outliers, this becomes a little bit problematic. For example, assume we have this data here. So we have this class of red X's and we have this class of green triangles, but let's say that we just have some kind of outlier observation. So this red X is an outlier. Now it's not going to really understand that. So it's still going to try and maximize this margin between the two classes so that this red X, which is all the way out there, becomes a support vector for this class of X's. And this green triangle here becomes a support vector for the green triangle. So that the SVM result, the decision boundary is right here because this maximizes this distance to each class. But 
really we know that that's an outlier and what we should have done is removed it or just ignored it so that the true decision boundary would be over here because that more accurately separates the two classes in their entirety rather than looking at this outlier. So that's one disadvantage to keep in mind with SVM. Now the last thing I'll say is that SVM generally comes in two flavors. There's a hard margin SVM, which is everything we just described. Now hard margin SVM just operates as we've been talking about. It takes the two classes and it basically enforces that we're going to have a decision boundary and everything on one side of the decision boundary gets classified as plus one and everything on the other side of the decision boundary gets classified as negative one. Now this is good for data sets that are linearly separable, which means that there is a line you can draw that achieves this separation, but most data sets in the real world are not linearly separable, which means that there's at least a couple of observations that make it so that you can't draw this clean line. For example, consider this more realistic data, where you have more or less a green triangle class and a red X class, but there's a little bit of noise, right? There's other observations that are where we would not necessarily expect, but just because of how the world works, that's where they are. Uh, for this context, we only took into account GPA and MCAT, but there's other things that can affect if you get into your top choice school. So those things taken into account, you're going to have some variation in the data. If we were forced to use a hard margin SVM, it just could not deal with this because it needs this clean separation between the classes. So most of the time we're going to use a soft margin version of SVM, which means that yes, I would like you to have everything on one side of the decision boundary be a certain class and on the other side to be the other class but I understand that's not how the world always works. So I'm going to allow you to make some mistakes, but I'm going to give you a penalty for every mistake you make, and I'm gonna give you a bigger penalty if the mistake is bigger. So for example, in this picture, we're gonna draw this decision boundary. We still have some support vectors here, but we'll see that everything on this side does get classified as plus one, but we're making a mistake on this red X, for example. And the mistake is rather large because this X is way out over here where we would confidently predict this to be plus one, but actually it's a negative one. So we're gonna give a rather large penalty there. We also have rather large penalties for these green triangles who are on the wrong side of the decision boundary. And if you notice, this little green triangle here is also misclassified, but we're not gonna give as big of a penalty because it is relatively close to the decision boundary. So we'll see how all these things get formulated mathematically when we look at our math SVM video, but this is the more common case you're gonna use in the real world, a soft margin SVM. So hopefully that helped you understand SVM in a nutshell. Again, we haven't looked at a single piece of math on this board, but just the intuition of SVM. SVM is a maximum margin classifier, which means that it is trying to maximize the size of this margin who is separating the two classes so that if new observations come in, we do have confidence that they're going to get predicted correctly. Okay, so um, if you learned something in this video, please like and subscribe for more videos just like this. Comments are always welcome and see you next time.